Michigan. Mr. Alia. <laughs> Frazier, Michigan. My name is Jade Fern. I will be the interviewer along with Nikki Masseroni, who will be the video operator. Mr. Alio, could you state for the recording, what war and branch of service did you serve in? World War II and the 257th Field Artillery Battalion and in the European Theater of War. And what was your rank in the beginning? Well, I started okay. off like a buck private and then eventually became a corporal. What unit? The 257th Field Artillery Battalion. Okay. Did you, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I was drafted. Oh, can you tell me a little bit about the process of being drafted? Well, yeah, they, uh, they give you, uh, 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 greetings, greetings, you have been drafted. I believe I have the greetings here, I'm not sure. Well, anyway, it's, it's a letter they sent you that you have to appear before the board, and uh, then you appear, bef then you have to have an examination, physical examination, and then they, uh, they uh, get you all together and uh, that's when they move you to whatever camp that you're going to be trained at. So uh, we went to Camp Gordon, Georgia. And uh, fortunately, most of the boys that were drafted that day from our, out, uh, from our area all went to the same place, and they formed a new field artillery battalion in Camp Gordon, Georgia. They brought the instructors over from New York, which they call a cattery, the non-commissioned officers, and to train us, and then they would promote whoever they thought were qualified to promote to lead their groups, and uh, and that's where we uh, we were trained. And we went to uh, to uh, maneuvers in Tennessee, and uh, well, what else you want to know? I wanted to know a little bit about the training. The training? Yeah. Well, the training, you know, when you first leave home, first time away from home, it, uh, it's strange, you know. You, you, good thing all the other fellows are in the same shoes. And uh, there's a lot of discipline, a lot of discipline. There's only one way to do things, and that's the Army way. I mean, whether it's right or wrong or indifferent, it's the Army way that you're going to do it. Otherwise, you're in trouble. So that was good. I mean, uh, uh, discipline was good. And uh, and if you mind your P's and Q's and uh, stay out of trouble, why, the food was relatively decent. And uh, the weather in Georgia was pretty good, too. How did it feel uh, leaving your family? It was, uh, it was tough at first, but uh, like I say, all the other guys were all in the same boat, and it, it kind of made you comfortable there. So you knew all the men that you went in with? Well, no, there was a few. There was a few I did know because of the fact that they were drafted on the same day I was, and, uh, and from the neighborhood, I believe there was, oh, maybe uh, four or five from the neighborhood that were drafted, but they, they were, we were all separated in different parts of uh, of the battalion. Some were in headquarters, some were in A battery, some B battery, some C battery. By the way, there's five batteries. There's the headquarters, A, B, and C, which are the gun batteries that have the guns. And then there's a service battery, which services the batteries with supplies and ammunition and so forth. Um, do you recall the first days in service? First day? Yeah. Well, Yes, they gave us a test, and uh, a, a, an aptitude test, and I had a person next to me that was taking a test, and he was constantly doing this, <laughs> you know, thinking, tapping, and uh, so for, unfortunately, I don't think I did too well on that test, but anyway, uh, that, I recall that incident. <laughs> Do you remember the instructors? The who? The instructors? The instructors? For the training? Oh yes, they were, like I say, they were from New York, 
and uh, they were a good bunch of guys. In fact, there's one that we I still correspond with. Uh, he's from New New Jersey. Yeah, very nice gentleman. Uh, he's a few years older than I am, but uh, we correspond at Christmas time. But they were all. Good bunch of two. but you didn't buddy buddy with them. They were, you held your distance. You know, you. That's one thing you didn't do. Uh, they didn't want to get too close. During World War II, where exactly did you go? Well, we went to uh, New Camp Shanks, New York, and then we left there. I believe it was September '44. And we arrived in New York, uh, in England, and we were in England for uh, I believe I have it uh, in my what did I do with my oh yeah we uh, we went to England and then we stood in England for a while and then we went to uh, across the channel and into France, La Havre, France. And uh, we, uh, from La Havre, France, we joined in with, a, with Patton's Third Army. And that's, we went directly, this was a little after the invasion of, uh, of France. And uh, we, with Patton's Third Army, we went to the Battle of the Bulge, and that's where we got our feet wet. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Well, the bulge was 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 very active. Lots of shells were expended there, and uh, my job was to lay wire. We had to have wire communications between the gun, the switchboard, and bat battalion headquarters. Uh, we had radio, but they tried not to use radio because, like I said before, they. They, uh, they get picked that up and you could get return fire. So uh, we concentrated on the wire and it was an endless job because you lay wire along the road and here comes tanks pulling off the road and they chew up your wire. Then you'd have to go out in the middle of the night with test, test clips finding out your wire. There might be 15, 20, maybe 50 wires there and trying to find your wire in that midst to get your unit intact. But it was, uh, it was hideous, but we, it was done. So it became very restless? Oh, that it was very restless. When did Always you, on the go. When did you guys ever sleep? <laughs> Whenever you could. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the elements. I don't believe, I don't believe the Army operates that way now anymore because they're all, all mod modernized. At that time, they, we weren't prepared for that weather. Their weather was similar to ours, a lot of snow, cold, and we weren't, we didn't have boots, we didn't have gloves, and uh, you're out in the elements, and so the only way you can keep dry is keep close to the muffler of your Jeep, dry your socks whenever you could, and that was the worst part. Um, did you see any combat? Oh, yes, that's the part, the bulge. That's, we got our feet wet right there at the bulge, yeah. And then after that, it was uh, a lot of combat. Can you tell me about some of your most memorable experiences? Well, there was one incident where we were laying wire. I tried to lay wire across country rather than along the road. So we, I was uh, in this farmland, we were, I was laying wire across country, and then the special forces with a hel white helmet was waving, hollering at me to stop. So I froze. I said, what's the trouble? He says, you're in the middle of a minefield. I said, oh my God. I had no bayonet to probe for mine, so I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, I talked to the Jeep driver, and I said, well, what do you want to do? I said, you're going to stay with the Jeep? He says, yes, I'm going to stay with the Jeep. I said, okay, follow me. And I said, I ran out of there. Well, first I started to walk. I said, oh, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go quick. So I started running. And he followed me. Fortunately, there was no mines that we triggered. So that wasn't a memorable, a memorable uh, time. Were you ever a prisoner of war? No, I wasn't. No. 
No, fortunately, I was never a prisoner. I never was wounded. Yeah. Were you awarded um, medals or citations? Well, we were in force. Not a special citation. We, our outfit was decorated by General de Gaulle of the French Second Army. And we were in four operations. Uh, I believe it's four operations, the, uh, which were called theater ribbons with four bronze stars, one for uh, Central Europe, the Ardennes, which was the bulge, Northern France, and uh, I can't think of the other one. That's in here somewhere. So there was four bronze stars. In other words, there were four major battles that we were in. And how did you receive the Oh, they, they, well, you had, we never got them when we got discharged. There was a form to, well, several years after, I found out there was a form you filled out, and you had to mail it to the government, and, and then they give them all the information that you had, like your serial number, and then they sent you whatever you were authorized through their records. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family during this time? VE, I believe they called it VE mail. It was like a, a, a sheet of paper that was folded. And you wrote your letter, and if you folded it and, and sealed it, and that was it. And they, they issued those to us, and that, that was their correspondence. There was no, no, we didn't have any paper available. Did you write often? I tried to, maybe once every week, every one, every two weeks I tried to. How did it feel being away from them? Oh it was it was it was it was sad. It it, it, it. you get emotional but then again it had to be done. Couldn't help it. How was the food like? Well the food during combat if you if you got a, a warm meal if you got a warm meal once a week, you were lucky. They had these K rations. They came in boxes, maybe eight inches long and four inches wide. And in this box, I believe they had a, 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 a dinner and a breakfast. The breakfast was a little can of scrambled eggs, a little carton of cigarettes with four cigarettes in it, a little candy bar, and I believe that was it. And the dinner had maybe a little can of cheese, a little flat can by the size of a tuna fish can. It's maybe six ounces. And uh, they had maybe three, two or three different things. One was cheese, one was uh, like a roast beef or something, or, or a hash brown, a hash, not hash brown, but a hash. Oh, it was nothing, not, nothing appetizing. Did you just get used to it after a while? Well, oh, you had to. If you were hungry, you had to eat something, you know. And there, there was a point there, if you saw a little... They had antelopes out there in the wild, in Germany, and in the, in the Ardennes. And uh, if you could nail one of those little cantaloupes, maybe you could have a, a warm dinner. About size, they were the size of a large dog. Um, how was the Prussian stress during this time? The what? The Prussian stress. Stress, like I say, is during the winter time, the stress was bad, and then that's when the battles were, were hot and heavy, too. It, uh, there was one time where, where I, uh, like I say, we had no sleep during the, 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 the bulge there because of the action was going on, and the wires were breaking, and, and I lost it all. And, for some reason, I don't know what happened. I must have passed out or something. So I found myself in an ambulance going to Paris. So uh, I for a rest for a week. So I was sent back for a week's rest, and then I came back. How was the resting period? Was it enjoyable? Or well, it was really for rest. I. It was like a hospital. It. Uh, 
there was nothing there to enjoy, really. Did you guys have plenty of supplies? No, the, the supplies, if you mean that we, 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 we got enough, enough food in those boxes, enough food, like I, we lacked things we really needed was gloves and boots to keep dry and warm. If you notice some of the pictures there, you, you'll see that we had, we were in overcoats in some of those places. And uh, it, uh, oh, I, 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 I must have went by them. Anyway, uh, the supplies, uh, sometimes we got supplies and sometimes we didn't. It isn't, uh, it, it was more of a conventional war, not like it is today, a technical war. Today, these, these guys get all the supplies. They, they're well, they're well uh, healed. In fact, you saw I have a Jeep there that needed a clutch. We threw it on its side, and a man had to get in there and try to hunch up parts to get to get the thing fixed so we can function. But that's the way it was. You made the best of what you had. Was there something special that any of you did for good luck to help you through it? No, not really. After a while, after a while, uh, you know, when you see so much death there, you, you go from day to day. You, you, luck meant, you didn't feel lucky after that. It just, you didn't know it. Maybe your day was tomorrow, maybe not. Fortunately, it wasn't for me, but it, it, it was, a lot of people lost their lives there. And it, uh, you took it a day at a time. And so how did you guys entertain yourselves during how did, we How did you entertain yourselves? There wasn't much entertainment. There wasn't much entertainment. We were pretty well on the go all the time. We, we didn't have too much. Oh yes, there was one time in Reims, France. We, uh, we found a wine cellar. And in this wine cellar was barrels of wine. So with all these barrels of wine, we had one our, our three-quarter ton tr uh, uh, truck driver, his name was Pop, he was the oldest one at the outfit. He, his name was Pop Hacker, we called him Pop Hacker, and he loved to drink. So here, here he'd come with a, with a barrel of wine. He wasn't satisfied with a bottle of wine. <laughs> he'd come with a barrel of wine, <laughs> and he'd put it on his three-quarter ton truck, and, and uh, he had wine for a long time after <laughs> that. But. Uh, we all got schnockered at that point. <laughs> but that was it, though. So there were no entertainers or yeah. anything to keep you guys, your spirits high? Nothing? No, not really. Where did you travel to while in the service? Any places? Where did we travel? Well. This was in early April, and then we went through, uh, well, if, uh, excuse me. There's so many places that, that I, I just can't put my finger on all of them. It's all in here in this document. Does any one place strike you? Do you remember any one place better than the rest? Any one place? Yeah. Well, Royan. Royan was a, was a place that, uh, that brings to memory the best. Uh, it was a place that after Royan, they only took six prisoners out of Royan. The rest, they, they were all them all died. They wouldn't surrender. And uh, when the French Second Army went in there, the only six Germans came out. Did you ever learn any of the languages? 
Well, like I said before, uh, uh, the French was very difficult, but uh, the German I picked up quick. But there was more time to correspond in German because that's where we were when the war ended, and uh, then you had a chance to speak to the public, you know, and that's, that's how I picked it up. Can you still speak any of it today? Well, just a few words like uh, Boganzi, or where are you going, uh, Spatzing, or, or All Bite, uh, a few words here and there, but not much. I, it's like anything else, if you, you don't practice it, you lose it, you know. Do you recall any humorous event that happened? Beg your pardon? Any humorous event that happened? No, not really. Did you? guys pull pranks on each other? Pranks? No. To keep each other? Well, I'm sure we did during basic training, but uh, after that, no, not really. Everything was serious. Can you tell me about some of the people in the photographs? Did you have? Oh, yes. These are, these are the gun sections the men in the gun sections. There were four guns to a, a battery, and I tried to take a picture of each one of them, and uh, I believe I got them all. And I don't know if I mentioned I was the only one in the outfit that had a cam camera. Did I mention that mm -hmm. before? I mean, while the camera was rolling. <laughs> and. Uh, this fellow was a clerk battery clerk, and he was a chief of gun section. This is a young lady, a little young lady that was a resident of the farm in Luxembourg. And uh, and this was Royan, the ruins of Royan. And this is the picture of, uh, of all the fellows of the flag. Here, let me show you the flag here. This flag hung on the command post, German command post in Royan. And when the French Second Army went in, I went in with them and took it down. If you want to. Uh, pull that in. This is the names of most of those fellas there that that I had autographed the flag. Like I say, uh, it's the last thing that came out of Royan. It shows a flag maker's name. So I'd like to donate this flag because it's no sense in giving it to any of my kids because they just hang on to it and store it. And I'd like to have it in a museum. All the men that you were with, were they friends with you when you went in? Or? Yes, we all stuck together. Fortunately, we all stuck together throughout the whole campaign. And uh, none of us ever separated. Do you still know many of them today? Or? Yes, well, not many of them. I think uh, the age guy got most of them. There's a few that I still correspond to, and uh, we, uh, we had reunions every year for, for the last, well, up until the last two years. Oh yes, there's a picture of the reunions of that. The last two years. Yeah, these are all the reunion pictures here. Let me get to the beginning of it. There we go. These are all the reunions. This is in 1968 with their wives. And 
Fritz, he was in the wire section, old Fritz Prezzarello. He's died, he, he's dead now. And this is Eli, he's, he's in Arizona. We, we still correspond. And until he went to Arizona, we used to golf and socialize together. And this is Don Lair, the supply sergeant. This is myself and my wife. And Charlie Ganelli, he's the fellow that I told you about that uh, was my neighbor. And we used to golf together. And John Goosens. Yeah, that's John Goosens there. He's, he lives in Saginaw. And it was, a, it was a good thing because, like I say, most of us were from Michigan. And uh, they pretty well all attended the uh, reunion until it got smaller and smaller in the last couple of years. Well, we went two years ago, and there was only 27 people there and half of them were wives. So there was not, not many of us left. So, uh, like I say, I think it's dissolved now. They have them anymore. But we all enjoyed ourselves there. What did you think of the fellow soldiers? Did I, what did I think of what? What did you think of the fellow soldiers or officers? The officers? We had fairly good officers, very good. Our, our, uh, our battalion commander was a West Pointer. He was a very good man. He, didn't, he was strictly business. I mean, he, he didn't uh, socialize too much with the other officers. But um, I had one incident with our captain. Remember that incident I told you about the minefield? Mm -hmm. When we got back, first sergeant called me over and he says, the Captain Polivchek wants to talk to you. So I went to see him. He says to me, he says, Elio, I hear you were in the minefield. I said, yeah, I guess, I guess we got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. He says to me, which hurt me deeply, he says, uh, he says, you know, if you would have blown up that Jeep, you would have had to pay for it. And I looked at him and I, I God, what's this man talking about? You know. Uh, couldn't understand. Here he wants me to pay for a jeep that was blown up by a mine, by an enemy in my mine. So after that, I had no more use for the man. No more use for the man. I, I thought that was a callous thing to say to a person. Instead of worried about his men, he's worried about a jeep. So anyway, that was one incident I'll never forget. That was the bad part of it. So how did you guys get along after that? I never got, a, in fact, Charlie, Charlie was his radio, this Charlie, where is he, Charlie Ganelli here, was his radio operator. And uh, here, Charlie was his radio operator, and he was a good friend of mine. And he would tell me, see, the, the, the captain had a jeep with a little trailer to handle his personal stuff. And the, the, uh, the officers were given a ration a monthly ration of, whisk, of liquor. So he used to hide it in his trailer, and Charlie used to tell me where his trailer was parked. And I'd go over there and raid it just purposely, <laughs> just because I didn't like the man after that. <laughs> and he knew I was, he knew somebody was into his trailer, and he didn't know who it was, and he was angry, and he was trying to find, and then he had an idea what might have been me, but he couldn't prove anything. But uh, that was the only way I could get even with the man, is to <laughs> steal his, uh, and he never found out? He never found out. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Did you uh, keep a personal diary during this time? Besides all the photos you took? Did yeah. you write down any of the experiences you had? No, no, I never kept a note other than just taking pictures. I could have. Uh, well, this, this thing here was documented by, by this, uh, this fella named uh, Kula, Edward Kula, and he uh, he was from headquarters battery, and he documented everything down, and uh, plus the information he got from headquarters, and uh, it pretty well tells the whole story of uh, 
the history of our battalion from day one to the day we were discharged. Do you recall the day your service ended? Do I what? Recall the day your service ended? Yes. When we uh, we landed, we landed at Newport News, Virginia. It was about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and they did have a band out there. It was they were cold and <laughs> they were playing a band as we were getting off the ship. Anyway, they brought us to a, a a mess hall, and they gave us a state dinner, and then they put us on a train. They put us on a train, and I, of course, we didn't know where we were going, and they sent us to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And they had a process of, of discharging people 24 hours a, all through the night. And I was discharged about three o'clock in the morning. And here I was discharged and here in a camp all by myself. All of it. So what am I going to do? So I thought rather than get on a bus and, and, and go to town, I thought I'd get a, go to one of the barracks. And I went in there and unrolled one of the mattresses and I went to sleep for the night. I, I, I figured the next day I'll have a fresh start in life, because this is all new now. So now I have to go to town. I went to town and got on a bus. No, I went to a, a train depot, got on a train to go come home to Detroit. I lived in Detroit at the time. Then I was coming home to a, a new family now, because my, my uh, father had remarried, because he was a widower. So I had, had, had a new stepmother to meet my sister had married, and there's a, my two sisters had married. There's two brother-in-laws I had to meet, plus a, a niece that I had never seen. So it's like I say, it's, it was a new experience. So it was exciting, or how did you feel? Well, like, I, I felt a little, you know, different. I was a different person than when I left. Mm -hmm. I was more mature, more... So I, uh, I felt different. It wasn't the same. But uh, you had to go on with life. What did you do um, afterwards in the days and weeks that followed? Well, <laughs> there was another incident. I thought I'd rest a little while for, it was a few, maybe four weeks, about a month, before I decided I want to go back to my old job. I worked at Federal Mogul Corporation. So I went back to apply for my old job and they told me that it had been filled, that I had no longer, didn't have that job anymore. I couldn't have that job. They had a, they had a new person in there and they had a new system working, so they said the job was filled and they, so I kind of was disappointed, so I thought, then as, uh, as days went by, I got angry and I thought, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go down to the draft board where I was drafted. So I went down there and a woman was in charge. I says, you know, I said, you drafted me three years ago. I says, took me away from a job and I says, fought a war and come home and I says, I don't even have the job again. So she says, I know, she says, there's, legally, she says, it's, it's not right and legally there's nothing I can do about it. She says, all I can do is give you satisfaction. So she picked it up, picked up the phone, and she says, "I want to talk to the CEO of Federal Mogul." So the operator says that he was in the conference. She says, "I don't care if he's in the conference. I want to speak to him." She says, "This is the government speaking." So they got him on the phone, and she chewed him up one side and up down the other. She says, "Is this the way you treat your your veterans?" She says, "And I understand you do government work." She says, "I'm going to do everything in my power to prevent the government from doing it." giving you any more business. Anyway, that made me feel better, but I still didn't have my job. But he did say, come down. I went down and it was the same routine. He says, well, we can't break up this system we got now. It's altogether different and you can't have your job. So, so then I went into another line of work. Instead of working in a factory, I started in construction as a plaster. So did you ever go back to school? Well, the plastering was a, was a trade that, that had four years of schooling plus work, and that's the schooling I got. Did you make any close uh, friendships on the service, obviously, that you've held with after the 
close friendships? Yes, like I say, Charlie Ganelli, Eli Abramov, several of them, we socialized, we kept in touch, and we still do today. So. Did you join a veterans organization? Yes, I joined a VFW right after I come out from the neighborhood. And we kept together for about four or five years, and then eventually it faded out and uh, it dissolved because not enough members kept kept it active enough. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, they named it after uh, a fellow in the neighborhood named Shornak that was killed in action. They named, they named it after him, but uh, I guess the reason it just dissolved was uh, People lost interest in, 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 they wanted to forget about the war and they, they lost interest in it. How did you feel? Did you want to forget about it or? Well, I did for, well, I did, yeah, I did. I tried to put it behind me. In fact, I never discussed this stuff with my wife even. I, a lot of this stuff here is probably new to her. And. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and the fact that it's just in the later years that when we got together that we kind of reminisced about it, and that was it. What about your children? Did you tell them no, anything? I, really, I didn't tell them too much. I just gave a few souvenirs, and we, we kind of never discussed that. I, I thought it was something that should be forgotten. It wasn't a pleasant memory, so. How do you think it has affected you as a person? I think being in the service did a lot for me. I mean, it, it, it put a little more discipline in me. I mean, at that young age, you were kind of a little reckless. And I did, I think, I believe it put some discipline in me. And, 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 and you learned to live together with a group of people, and you had to learn to trust people because uh, you lived in a in a barrack that if you had money, you never worried about it being taken, and, and, and you had an honor system that you had lived up to it. So it's not something you would regret? No, no, I, I don't regret being in the service. How has all the experiences and everything that you lived through affected your life now? Well, it, all I can say is it just took three years out of my life, but uh, I, belie I believe it made, a, it made me a better person. I believe it did, because I, at that time, at my, when I went in, I wasn't uh, very stable. I was, uh, I was more of a freelance wine woman and so on. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Any experiences that we haven't covered? I know we haven't covered a lot. Well. Um, maybe about like the Battle of Bulge. Is there anything else you'd like to add about that? About what? The Bulge. Oh, the Bulge. Yeah, that was that was that was the most fierce. But uh, like I say, there's a lot there that. I'd like to just put it behind me. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything you've ever Not covered? really. Most of it's all here and in the pictures and in the documents. Of course, that's 60 years ago. A lot of the memory, a lot of things are forgotten. You know what I mean? The little things that, probably the happy things are have been forgotten and it, the bad things stick with you. Right. <laughs> okay. Can you send me that off? Well, thank you very much. It was You're very welcome. Interesting. I'm sorry if we didn't get to cover everything that you wanted to. I hope we did. Well, I think, but yeah. It was, a, it was a good experience, so thank yeah, you thank very you. much. You're welcome. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have told you things before the camera was on because it the discharge, my serial number, separation from Camp Better, Barry, Indiana, and this is the back part. 
Yeah, that, that was the bad part of that person. Even the fingerprints. Uh, you see, I couldn't become a criminal because they had my fingerprints <laughs> right from the day one. And this was the. Uh, the field, this was my title. The field wire chief was responsible for 12 men and equipment, and also laying what maintenance, maintaining, and taking apart of wire cable. Communication system operator, portable switchboard, use of electricians, tools, and equipment. It was assigned to 254th Seal Artillery Battalion. 15, 15 months in Europe theater. Oh, this is. Uh, My soldier's paybook, <laughs> individual pay record. And as a corporal, well, this is the, uh, as a corporal, I was earning $53 a month. And then I got a raise. No, is that price good? Yeah. No, no, that was when I got the raise. It was $53.96 a month. I think the buck private was 40, 40, uh, 40 some dollars. And I try to document the places where the divisions we supported. This is what I forgot to ask you. When you left, you left as a corporal, right? Yeah. No, I want to know more about that. That was another thing. See, my rank was supposed to, my title for what I did was supposed to be a sergeant, chief of section. Really? And that was another reason I did. I disliked my commanding officer. He never gave me that <laughs> other stripe, which meant more money. He never gave me the sergeant rating. I had the responsibility, but not the. Uh, and he would. He couldn't take that. He couldn't take me away from the job because we were. I was trained for it. And when we went overseas, then there was nobody to replace me unless I had got killed. And uh, so you see, he. Do you think it all back, went back to the experience of the, the minefield incident? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just always held it against you? Yeah. But can you pick in Arizona that I still correspond with? And this is Chuck in L.A. They call him Bugs, nickname. He, he was my neighbor also, and he was the, uh, the batter commander's driver uh, and, and radio operator, and that's the one that told me where the liquor was. <laughs> Good Harry Doc Truman, he's the medic, and Don Lair, we, he had quite a schnabel, and we used to call him the nose, <laughs> that was his nickname. Stanley Anderson, he was from the gun section, John Ganassi, what, what, what was his job? I believe he was in a gun section. Or, Harold Holt, he was in a wire section, he was one of my boys. Cash Kowaleski, he was a Jeep driver. He was a careless driver. He's always banging that Jeep around, always tearing it apart. Clyde DeMerit, I believe he was in a gun section. Billy Eisenberg, he was in a gun section. Fritz, he was my uh, a telephone operator at the guns. He was a wire, he was in a wire section. Cal Antonio, he was in a gun session. He was an artist, looking you to tell by his signature. Dash Butcher, he was our first sergeant. Real nice guy. Tough as nails. If you ever made a, if you ever watched in Hollywood, where they would make a movie of a, of a, of a, of a